Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Graham Stewart, and I will be uh, moderating this virtual town hall this afternoon. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us through the uh, Zoom webinar uh, and also watching the live cast on uh, YouTube. Glad you were able to join us. Um, so just wanted to run through a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, so thanks to everyone who submitted a question in advance. Uh, we'll be peppering those through uh, the session as we go along. Um, where possible, I mean, it won't surprise anyone to know that there was a fair amount of overla overlap in terms of what people were interested in. So we bundled some of the questions together uh, in the interest of time so we can get through a few more of them uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, we'll also be taking questions live. So there's two ways you can do it. You can use the email address conversations at yourq.ca. That's conversations at yourq.ca. Um, I'll be putting that up on my screen shortly. Uh, you can also use the Q&A function in Zoom webinar if you're uh, watching in Zoom uh, right now. So that's down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Q&A, you can type in your question and then somebody in our moderating staff will uh, acknowledge you and uh, put the question forward into the queue and hopefully we'll be able to address quite a few uh, that way. Now, inevitably, there's going to be more questions asked uh, to these various channels today than we have time to answer. Um, so anything we don't get to, uh, we will uh, kind of collate all of those and forward them to the people with the answers uh, and you will get a response uh, by email um, sometime after the meeting. So uh, that's something uh, we're committed to doing. So with that, I would like to hang, hand it over to uh, President Lenton to get us started. Well, thank you very much, Graham. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. Uh, I'm very looking forward to having this opportunity to meet with you today virtually and be able to answer your questions. We very much appreciate you making the time today and after the uh, open university town hall that we had, it really became clear that we needed to have an opportunity to reach out and create uh, time for our course directors, our faculty, to be able to drill down on some of the issues that are impacting you directly. Uh, before we get underway, I would like to make a land acknowledgement. I do appreciate uh, virtually that we are not all sitting on the land of York University. And so this land acknowledgement may be different depending on your space and location. And if that's the case, I would ask each of you to take responsibility for your doing, uh, undertaking your own land acknowledgement. Um, as a member of York University, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long standing relationships with York University before we occupied this space. So, York University acknowledges the, its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. This area, known as Tecoronto, has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. I would like to take a moment to ask the other VPs on this call to introduce themselves, and then I'll provide a few opening remarks, which, which I hope will answer um, some of the questions that we have received so far. So Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Phillips, Provost and Vice President Academic. Hi, everyone. Lee. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you again for the town hall meeting number two. I'm Ri Wang, Interim Vice President of Research and Innovation. And Sheila. Uh, Koi Koi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sheila Kote Meek, and I'm the Vice President, Equity, People, and Culture. Look forward to this afternoon. Miigwech. So I really want to start my remarks by thanking each and every one of you. I've just been incredibly impressed by the way that the entire community has come together to work together to protect and first and foremost to be thinking about how we can ensure that our students were able to continue their winter term and continue to make progress with their academic studies and students who are ready to graduate will be able to do that. But also working collaboratively with one another 
and with our broader communities on how we could respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Having addressed the winter term, um, and we have summer now well underway, summer planning, um, it will very soon necessarily <clears throat> become time for us to think about the fall and the broader issues um, that are going to be impacting us longer term. And I want to share with you that there's a temptation, given the severity of this particular crisis, to focus our response simply on mitigation and trying to manage the risks uh, and those risks that may be trending upward for us over the next period of time. But it's incredibly important for us to balance the amount of time that we're spending on dealing with the immediate uh, challenges with having a view to what we might be able to do to recover. And are there opportunities, are there actions that we could take that would support early recovery? And are there imaginings that we would have now about even post-pandemic, about how we might need to do things in order to try to maximize our ability to arrive at uh, normal operations or perhaps a new normal operations? I do want to emphasize that all of our decisions are first and foremost uh, about to ensuring the safety and the well-being of our entire community. We do understand that you are not only concerned about your, our work and our students, but also about your personal health and about your family. And I know that we'll hear um, shortly from, from Sheila about the various supports that are available for you if you are facing stra additional stress or anxiety and how you're managing this significant shift that we're undertaking in moving basically the operations of entire university off of two campuses and, and doing it from our home. Before turning to the provost, I would like to say a little bit about fall and how we're approaching fall. People obviously uh, want the uncertainty to be resolved and they're very anxious to know what is going to happen in fall. The challenge for all of us is that we must be guided by Toronto Public Health and we must be guided by what the entire system is doing uh, regarding when we're going to be able to lift the social isolation and when we might have broader testing and tracking that would allow us to resume uh, our attendance on campus. Given that we have this high level of uncertainty, the approach that we have to take in order to ensure that we can pivot from one path to another and to increase our agility in being able to accommodate um, how the pandemic might actually unfold over the next few months is to do scenario planning. So the university is basically, the administration has been undertaking three scenarios, a more positive scenario, which would involve us actually being able to attend to fall classes, a more conservative scenario that it might be not September, but January before we would be able to have access to the campuses and an intermediate scenario that we actually think is the most probable of the three scenarios. And that involves the assumption that there will be significant social distancing requirements in place still in the fall term that would prevent large groups of people coming together. And that we may have to assume uh, a fairly high degree of online, especially for larger classes that may in well um, be classes over 50, for example, with the hope that we would be able to introduce some face-to-face -face components either later in the fall term or perhaps even earlier, but only in smaller groups. So we are currently in the process of assessing those scenarios and what the impact could have. Clearly a very important issue for universities is that even with access to our campuses, we must assess what's going to happen with international borders. And if international borders stay relatively thick, or if countries only open their borders to certain other countries, we could see a significant impact on our international students, even if our domestic students only experience a much smaller decline. The impact, uh, even for example, a 50% decline in international intake 
in combined with the other costs that we have. Of course, we've lost revenue from the bookstore, from ancillary fees and so forth. We've also needed to invest significant amounts of revenue into online education, supports for students, additional monies for students who needed to come back. Um, so I would say that realistically, um, that, that alone, that kind of scenario could easily um, be around a hundred million dollar impact. Uh, so that's where, but those are the scenarios that we're planning. We won't really have a good sense about which of those scenarios we're going to go down, um, which is most likely probably until mid-May. We are aiming for mid-May and working very closely with government at, at every level, as well as the other universities, because of course, students have to accept their offer by June 1. Faculty members, course directors, they need to design their courses. So there needs to be some level of confidence and confirmation about which of those scenarios that we're, we see ourselves having to pursue. So look, I'd be happy to answer more of your questions, but with that, um, I just would like to close by saying that based on winter and summer, there's ample evidence that this community uh, has all of the ability and the commitment to our students to ensure that we are well prepared to manage the fall term until hopefully our situation can return uh, and we can have more active um, access to our campuses. I do wanna just thank each and every one of you. And with that, I'll turn it over to the provost. Thank you, Rhonda. And I wanted to start in just, just where you left off of uh, expressing my gratitude also to the absolutely exceptional faculty and instructors we have here at York University. Um, I really am so grateful and I know students are so uh, grateful for all the work that's been done to shift us to online and remote uh, teaching and learning. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that all of you have had a chance to go to the main COVID-19 website that York University has up because we've archived there all of our communications on things like um, uh, access to buildings and the process if you need to request special access to get into a building, um, working remotely. Uh, we've been communicating with you also about uh, issues like tenure uh, and career tracks and um, uh, the fact that uh, every tenure track faculty will have an opportunity now to pause their, their clock, um, their tenure clock during this period. We've been in touch with you about um, those of you who may be concerned about disruptions to your research and particularly your sabbatical plans and the process for requesting um, some help and changes in those sabbatical plans. Um, and, you know, of course, also and also on that website is archived our communication about our summer terms being delivered exclusively online and remotely. Um, so after you've gone to the main coronavirus website, I hope the next place that you're going is the Teaching Commons, which is uh, our main website where we have um, uh, put together all of the resources that we are offering to uh, instructors over the summer to help them, to help you uh, make that transition. Uh, there's everything from uh, videos and webinars and online workshops to a virtual help desk to a team site with um, peer mentors that you can talk to, people who've done this before, who have volunteered to uh, offer support and help. Um, we will be continuing to build up those supports um, over the coming weeks. Uh, so that's at the Teaching Commons website. And if you click on the Going Remote tab, you will get uh, immediate access to all of that. So although I'm very excited to see what people have managed to do uh, with online and remote learning, and there's lots of great creativity that people are showing. I've also been reflecting in this time on how uh, vital it is that we also get to interact in person again and how much um, we lose by not having those in-person interactions. So I know that I will never again take for granted the, um, the uh, ability to be on campus, to be seeing my colleagues, to be working directly with students. Um, and we will be eager to resume that just as soon as we can do so safely. Uh, I know that um, many of you also have been expressing concern for your students and how they are doing and what we're doing to help them. It's great that we were able to finish all of the winter courses. Again, thank you to all the winter instructors. But we do know there's some students individually whose lives have been so disrupted that they were not able to finish their work. And so we will be supporting them uh, at a later time to complete 
uh, complete their terms. We also, as you know, as soon as we really got into this uh, public emergency, we created um, some emergency bursaries for our students. Some of them have lost sources of income or have extra financial needs right now. We created the um, York University COVID-19 Student Relief Fund that's available for our alumni, our donors, our supporters to contribute to, and many have been stepping forward in that way, which we very much appreciate. Um, those bursaries are also open to domestic and international students, very importantly. And we're also providing uh, co comprehensive support to those students who remain in residence on campus. We have over 600 students actually who really needed to remain in residence, many of them international students. So we're continuing to provide support to them and are committed to doing so. Our spectacular IT department had the foresight to order 1500 laptops uh, to be able to help uh, students, faculty and staff transition to online. And those resources will again be available over the summer. Um, and so uh, to all who've been part of this remarkable transition and coming together to really um, be able to continue our academic mission despite tremendous challenges, just once again, thank you. It's been quite something to witness from my perspective. So um, I will look forward to your questions. I really appreciate everyone who's made the time to attend today. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sheila Cote Meek, um, for some comments on health and well-being. Thank you, Lisa, for that. I also wanna echo um, what an incredible uh, community York University uh, is. I've only been here for six months and um, it's amazing to see how people have come together and accomplish what, what they have in such a short period of time uh, to pivot uh, in this way. So I just want to congratulate you, but also, um, you know, extend uh, my support as well out there to the community. And as the president said, this time uh, is really uh, a time of transition and it hasn't been an easy one uh, on anyone. And I know that uh, there's a number of supports out there that I would like to highlight. Um, York has responded with a variety of initiatives to support the community in terms of health and well-being, especially to our faculty and instructional staff. And even though our campuses usually require work on a required services model, we want to assure the community that we're still providing uh, services remotely and online. So York, um, of course, has the employee and family assistance program that's always available and is 100% confidential um, and is available uh, at a website. Um, it's a workhealthlife.com. You can obtain useful information there, but also there's a support there for health, nutrition, stress management, financial management, uh, parenting, elder care, and, and so forth. Um, wellness support services, including mental health services, are also accessible through the Health and Safety Employee Wellbeing Office. Uh, York also has their athletic and recreational department uh, has made it even possible to keep working out online um, through their MUV program. And more recently now we are, are working at compiling um, uh, mental health, wellness, uh, health and wellness programs and supports on campus. Uh, and we'll be shortly uh, launching what we're calling Wellness Wednesdays. So stay tuned for that. I believe the first uh, weekly opportunity to check in with ourselves and colleagues starts tomorrow. Um, so just want to reiterate, uh, I, find, I have found York to be a very caring uh, community and uh, certainly welcomed me here uh, six six months ago now. And I think it's important now, uh, important more now than ever to support one another through these difficult and challenging times. So if you're struggling or you know someone who is, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, it's only natural for us to experience moments where we feel uh, in distress or we have moments of um, anxiety and we really wanna be here to help our York community. Many thanks, miigwech, thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so uh, we'll just jump right into the questions then. A lot of people wrote in uh, with pre-submitted questions um, specifically about the move to online and, and remote instruction. 
Uh, this uh, sort of involves particular challenges and uh, you know requires a lot of additional work. And folks are wondering uh, what additional resources and supports will be made available to faculty as they move their courses online or to remote um, formats. I know we talked a little bit about this already, but maybe we can go into a bit more detail. I think the provost should take that uh, question. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think that you will see in the next few days that the um, Teaching Commons is going to be launching something called the BOLD Institute, BOLD standing for Blended Online Learning uh, Development. And uh, that's going to be a further um, enhancement of the programming that's available. Uh, there's different levels that will be available. So if people want to do a basic um, reorientation of their course to deliver remotely, there's um, uh, programming to help you with that. And then if people are interested in doing um, a more significant redesign of their course um, for uh, offering online, there's also a more advanced series uh, of, of learning sessions to do that. Um, I believe that the sort of most advanced version is around 30 hours actually uh, of, of instruction and sessions as well as one-on-one uh, -on -one advice and assistance um, as needed. Uh, we know that we're going to need more capacity in the teaching commons because colleagues are taking up um, the supports that are there with quite a bit of enthusiasm and wanting to do a good job of this, which is not a surprise. Uh, and so we are looking at different ways that we could, by drawing on the expertise within our own community, we have um, uh, tenure stream faculty, contract faculty, graduate students, all of whom have uh, tremendous pedagogical um, expertise to share, uh, and we're looking at different ways we can recruit that um, that support in, <coughs> pardon me, to add to what we already have got available in the Teaching Commons. I think that UIT will be continuing to um, reach out with the, offer, the offer of uh, technology supports if people need them. Uh, the email address, Ask IT, if you haven't used it yet, it's a great resource. And I'm also interested in hearing from members uh, of the community who are on this call about what additional supports you are looking for, um, for uh, making this transition to online. Um, I really think that we need to keep our finger on the pulse of the community and get your feedback. We're providing everything we can think of, um, uh, but uh, additional suggestions are welcome and can help us to refine that programming. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go now to a question that was uh, submitted by email, uh, which uh, says, uh, the COVID-19 crisis is exposing the depth of the inequities between our students as we move into online and remote learning, uh, e.g. access to technology, privacy issues, and the need for different kinds of accommodations. In our unit, we are struggling to address these needs and to come up with protocols to support students and course directors as we go along. Given that these inequities will have an ongoing impact on student success, are there any university-wide initiatives to help us better understand and address equity and student needs going forward? Well, let me just start by saying that um, the initial response to making sure that students had the technology that they needed was one of the first things we did. And we understood very well that we could not assume that all students had equal access to either the equipment that they would need or even the internet access that they might need. And other students might be in circumstances where there were many people in the home. So technology was an immediate concern that we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to laptops, that we had sorted out access to internet, in some case providing keys um, were necessary. We will continue, we've continued that over the summer. So for in preparation for summer programming, um, the technology office is open again, and we're looking at that same um, program, that loaning program. We're also understanding that space um, could become an issue. And as we're able to provide different kinds of support. So for example, this is a, an issue that we'll have to be undertaking um, with exams as well that if it were to become possible for us to start a loan program of textbooks out of the library, everyone knows that access to the libraries have been closed, um, but in the same way that uh, we've seen other takeout services emerge, something that we, conversation that we would like to have with our own emergency operations group to have with Toronto 
of public health is whether or not we could start to um, provide a takeout uh, service for library resources that might be available. And of course, we also understood very well that there were different financial needs for our students that would be impossible for us to fully assess. And that's why we really felt in addition to the monies that we were able to increase that we also had to have a student relief program uh, going forward and that, that uh, we could respond to different types of financial needs that our students have. We are certainly committed to ensuring and we've also um, speaking and advocating with government around the absolute imperative that of all the things they might do to stabilize higher education that making sure that they are taking the necessary steps so that students are not held back from continuing with their education due to financial reasons. And so we've been speaking with them about the kinds of supports that they're gonna put in place, what's happening with OSAP um, and, and other kinds of um, uh, resources that students might need. I don't know whether or not Lisa has anything that she'd wanna add, but those are some of um, the areas that we're very attentive to in trying to ensure that uh, our commitment to access stays in place. Yes, I would just uh, say thanks to all that work at the unit level to really make sure that different students with different needs are accommodated and supported. Um, I would encourage you to contact your associate dean's office because the associate deans have actually been putting together sort of one page guides about um, how we can address different kinds of accommodation needs, for instance, in these very um, unprecedented circumstances. So whether a student already has um, an accommodation or whether they now need an accommodation because of the having to do online learning, having to be at home and so forth. Um, our student accessibility services remain open. They are available online. Um, and so uh, I think that the associate deans are, are good place to check in with in terms of whether there is any um, anything that could um, speed up that work for you of, of sorting out what options are available for students. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to remind everybody uh, who is uh, listening in the Zoom webinar and on YouTube that uh, closed captioning is turned on uh, for this meeting. We have real-time captioning going. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom window there, there's a little closed caption button. You can click that to, uh, to get at the closed captioning and also uh, through the, the YouTube toggle. So that is available. Now, uh, President Lenton, you mentioned um, uh, briefly the uh, Emergency Operations uh, Center, and we actually had a question uh, in about, uh, can you please describe who is involved in York's emergency management uh, system and uh, how are decisions made and who is making them? So York University had a comprehensive emergency and disaster plan that's posted on the website, and I just can't remember the link right now, but if you search for it, it'll come up quite easily. And our campus safety office that's led by Samina Sami had an absolutely huge wealth of experience and expertise that they were able to bring um, that informed our emergency plan. And our emergency plan brings together an emergency operations group um, it, it evolves over time as the level of the emergency increases. So the, uh, we are at a level three emergency in this situation, and that's defined in the plan. And that emergency operations group involves a very expansive set of subcommittees um, that um, deal with logistics, uh, they deal with specific community requests. Um, there's a huge number of uh, different committees. There's also an academic, continu an academic continuity group. That group is led by the provost and with the deans. And all of, as questions emerge in the emergency operations group, they go out to one or other of these different groups and recommendations come up to the emergency management group. And the emergency management group is led by the president and it includes all of the VPs, um, as well as a number of key individuals across the university. On the emergency operations group, the larger group, we also have expert faculty 
um, on that group who have particular expertise in the area of this type of emergency. The Dean of Health, um, James Urbinski, um, Steve Hoffman. Um, we also have a nurse uh, colleague with this considerable experience. I'm sorry, I'm just forgetting the, the name of the nursing colleague. Um, Lisa might remember. So the whole point of our process is to make sure that the academic side of the house, the administrative side of the house, that we're working together cohesively and then sending out requests to proper um, committees. And those committees are also linked up with the university-wide sector. So we, there's an HR committee that you know, was looking at um, some issues around HR. Um, Carol McCauley, our vice president of finance and administration is talking to all of the other vice presidents when it came to you know, the, the situation on campus. And of course, there are some matters that go to Senate executive. So when it comes to specific recommendations that the academic continuity committee felt would be important, for example, the suggestion to allow a pass fail option that falls under the purview of Senate executive. And so those recommendations were taken to Senate executive. So it's, it's quite a comprehensive um, organizational structure to make sure that we're able to respond quickly and nimbly but that we're also properly consulting, not only with um, members of our own community, but taking advantage of expertise uh, with government, with other Ontario universities through the Council of Ontario Universities and even Universities Canada. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have a question in from uh, the Q&A uh, in the Zoom webinar, which is some courses require in-person instruction, like, for example, uh, a chemistry lab. Uh, what is the plan for those courses in the fall? Does the provost want to uh, maybe? Yes, I, I'd be happy to. Um, we're already looking at this for the summer because, of course, there are a number of lab and studio and hands-on courses that are taught in the summer. And I must say that our colleagues have come up with some pretty um, ingenious ways to tape experiments and uh, do virtual labs. So some, to some extent, um, there are some creative options for uh, continuing with those activities, but there is a limit to that. And there are some courses that uh, really do need to have in-person um, sessions. I'm thinking of our nursing students doing practica. I'm thinking of our theater students, our film production students, our sculpture students. There's, there's many who, for whom it's, it's difficult to replace some of the elements of their program with online or remote learning. And so we are in the fall, we're looking at different options for how we might be able to resequence some elements of programs or some courses. Are there ways that we could shift those to a bit later in the term or the year in the hopes that as time goes on, we'll be able to do more and more in-person activities? Um, could we think about uh, towards the latter half of the fall term, is it possible to be coming back for small labs or small tutorials, for instance? Um, and so uh, I think part of it is about um, rethinking the timing of where those courses sit um, it, within the program. There is the possibility also that um, some students, a larger than normal number of students will want to defer their admission to the winter. Um, whether it's an international student who um, it does not, is not able to meet the, um, you know, all the prerequisite requirements of getting visas and English tests done and so forth in order to be able to get to, um, uh, to Toronto um, for the fall, or whether it's people who are not feeling comfortable being in settings with, uh, with a lot of other people initially, uh, for whatever reason. Um, they may prefer to start in January. So I think that what we're going to be doing also, this is right now a discussion mainly with um, uh, the deans, but I know chairs and directors are starting to think about this, and that will accelerate over the coming weeks. Uh, what could we offer in the winter that maybe normally we would have done in the fall, but we might need to offer in the winter instead or in addition? And then pushing that out a bit, are there things that might need to be offered in the spring that normally would have been taken in the winter so those students who had a late start are able to get back on track and not lose a whole year of progress. So I think, you know, with graduate students on graduate programs, there's another whole layer of issues there with research field, field work that needs to be done or lab work that needs to be done that's been disrupted this summer. 
and every uh, graduate program director is working right now to identify uh, what are the possible solutions for those students. Um, so those are a few thoughts about how um, we might be able to deal with, with those issues. They are some of the tougher issues to address uh, when we can't be in person on campus. Thanks for the question. Okay, so we'll take another question from uh, the Zoom Q&A. Um, so President Linton has mentioned the potential financial impacts on the university of this crisis in its many dimensions. And she has also mentioned that she and the university leadership are in close contact with the provincial government. Could you please elaborate on the content of these discussions? What is the province indicating with respect to the financial support they will put in place for York in the coming period of time? Well, I don't think it will necessarily um surprise uh, colleagues to know that the provincial government has been completely hands-on with dealing with the pandemic and the health implications. And so education um, has not been necessarily um, received their undivided attention at this particular time. We are certainly competing with other sectors. I will say that uh, the minister Mr. Ross Romano of, of um, colleges and universities has met with the presidents of the Ontario sector several times. Um, that led to the original commitment of $25 million to offset some that was distributed amongst the universities and colleges to offset some of the costs that um, MCU knew that we were incurring. Then most recently, uh, in terms of our advocacy, the government had asked each university to specify the top three priorities that we would have in terms of uh, packages that they might be willing to put together to provide some uh, support for uh, the universities. And they asked the same thing of the colleges. So, in the case of our priorities, uh, all of the executive heads got together be, at the call of the universities because we knew that we might be much more successful if we could agree on what were the major areas of priorities and that the government was hearing the same message from all of us. And so certainly the top priority was support for our students to make it possible for them to be able to have, um, to be able to return to their university studies. Um, the second priority was stabilizing the higher education system, given the potential loss, especially of the international students in 2021. And so the, we gave them several ideas that they could provide in terms of stabilizing the sector, um, including delaying the SMA3 uh, implementation, which they agreed to do, um, potentially removing the or adjusting the enrollment quarter based on the drop that we are anticipating in 2020, 2021, um, removing the international student uh, cost that they require of universities um, and provide ensuring that they were um, uh, thinking about other uh, strategies that might be helpful in terms of taking on some of the, um, in terms of the third priority, the, uh, the support for online. So we all know that it's going to be key for success to have high quality instruction. And that really requires a huge investment in online as well as other remote types of instruction. And so we've, the third priority was to ask for some financial support so that the universities, each university, could develop the particular strategies that we felt would be most effective for our programming, but obviously in collaboration with the other universities. So that's some of the advocacy that's been happening. And just very briefly, we've also been advocating at the federal level. The federal level recently announced an, an infrastructure amount of money. So we advocated to ensure that universities would be included in those infrastructure, um, uh, in that infrastructure of funds. Um, we've also been asking them to be thinking about what priority, what funds they might be able to have for us. You know, some will remember that there was a great deal of money that was put aside for experiential education. We wanted to ensure that those funds would be kept, but delayed if necessary, because rolling out 
a work integrated learning program right now um, would be you know, challenging. So we are really basically advocating at all levels, uh, including at the municipal level, to ensure that um, the higher education sector is going to receive um, support. Do we have details on what they're going to do with those priorities yet? Not yet. We are awaiting their response. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we received a question, uh, has the university given some thought to support for faculty and staff with small children, especially if elementary and high schools remain closed for, substantially long, uh, for a substantially longer period of time? It would be challenging uh, for such parents to balance homeschooling their children while at the same time delivering lectures and fulfilling their work obligations. I don't know if the provost wants to start with that response. Sure, and I might ask uh, Sheila if she wants to contribute as well. Uh, I'm very aware of this being a big issue for anybody with small kids, um, younger children at home when school is canceled, there's no camps, there's not even the normal kind of network of supports one can draw on with um, neighbors and grandparents necessarily as we're all trying to keep our distance from each other. So it is a real challenge and I'm also aware that, you know, this does have a, a kind of gender dimension to it. Uh, any, any parent of young children is really going to be feeling that strain right now. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's not unfair to say that uh, women especially are finding that that really can be a challenge for maintaining their research, getting their teaching done. So we did, um, we did release a memo just very recently about making a request if you need to, to access a teaching space on campus. Uh, during the summer. And we do need to keep that to the absolute essential minimum um, because we have to comply with provincial emergency orders that we not have people um, you know, working on campus. Um, however, a case can be made in exceptional circumstances where there is no quiet space or equipment at home that would allow for lectures to be delivered, for instance, or online office hours or seminars to be held that uh, someone could make a request to come in and be able to use um, spaces and equipment at the university campus. So that is available. And we were thinking of parents of young children as one of the groups that might need to access that. Um, and so I would, I would encourage you to check out that building access memo. And I'm wondering if Sheila would want to add anything. And I'm just encouraging people to come forward with suggestions as well about other ways that we could support colleagues in that uh, in that situation. Thanks, Lisa, for that. Um, I think it's also, I, I really like that you acknowledge that it's a difficult time, especially if you have young children at home, but also uh, for families that are caring uh, for uh, elderly uh, people, uh, maybe in their home or even uh, in another home, uh, having to get out and buy groceries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we do have an accommodation policy that's um, posted on the Center for Human Rights, Equity and Inclusion Office. And I would encourage people to have a look at that because there are some allowances made for um, issues uh, around this particular uh, area. And as well, um, there's a number of resources that are available uh, online through, um, through um, uh, human resources, uh, as well as the Center for Human Rights that may be of assistance. Um, and I also would encourage you to reach out directly to us uh, if you are one of those persons that are experiencing the, the, uh, those kinds of situations so that we can work to try to accommodate as best we can. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, what steps are being taken to source an effective, equitable, and secure mode of proctoring online examination, examinations in such disciplines as commerce and economics? So this was obviously a significant challenge. Um, and the province, that's one area that the province has had some interest in determining whether or not they could be of help. Um, we were working with them to try to utilize their solution and in fact had uh, some problems with it. So we've been working on our own um, solution right now. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to the provost because she'll have more details. Yeah, this has proven to be, I think the most challenging uh, thing to sort out is how do you replace large scale in-person exams 
um, in a way that uh, protects uh, academic integrity, academic honesty. Um, and uh, we really were hopeful that the Proctor Track solution developed by eCampus Ontario was going to be a real step forward. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, it, there's still work to be done to really perfect that technology. Um, there were a lot of concerns that students were expressing around uh, the ability for, um, you know, a camera to be seen into their private space. Um, the, uh, the fact that the software doesn't necessarily recognize when there might be people in the background because they live with you, not because they're there for any kind of cheating purposes, uh, but there's, you know, they're not in a, in a necessarily in a, a room all by themselves. Um, concerns about security and privacy, um, access to their information. So um, we have had uh, the one uh, in economics, I believe, a decision was made uh, based on that um, challenging experience actually for LNPS not to use Proctor Track at all uh, to finish off winter term courses. And we're still trying to figure out if there's a better solution out there that um, for those who want to have online exams uh, with a with an invigilation component or a proctoring component, if there is a solution that would um, address those student concerns. So I will say that we're still working on it. And one of the great suggestions that I had actually from a student leader was that we make sure when we start the summer courses that students are aware from the beginning whether the course includes an online proctored exam. So that students have the ability to make an informed choice if they're not comfortable with whatever solution we've managed to land on by that point that they don't have to take a course that then later turns out to have um, an exam technology that's not acceptable to them. So. Um, we, uh, we hope that that will at least allow students to have upfront knowledge so that they can make uh, the choice that they want there, but we still haven't given up entirely on finding a solution that would address the concerns, which would really be um, the ideal in terms of the flexibility that instructors have to create the kind of evaluation scheme that they really want to have and they feel is needed in their course. Okay, so related to this, uh, some concerns around privacy and, and uh, security online, uh, we've had a few people ask about uh, Zoom. And one question is, there are many companies and educational institutions that have banned Zoom due to security concerns. Uh, is your considering a switch to other platforms such as Cisco WebEx? So Zoom was very quickly responsive to the concerns that were raised. Um, and put in a variety of different mechanisms to address those concerns. Um, at this point, we have a fairly high comfort level uh, in the part on the part of the community with Zoom. So I don't anticipate that we would be switching at this point. Everyone's sort of gotten used to the Zoom technology and to ask people to uh, have to convert to a new technology is not something that we think we need to do at this time. I think, so, I think I think I think the provost wants to add something. Uh, just uh, building on um, what the president said, uh, we have actually made a number of choices at York about um, making certain default settings and heightening the um, the privacy protections and so forth in order to required password protection for every meeting, for instance. Um, in order to address a lot of those concerns. And what we do find is that Zoom is, you know, a great um, technology in terms of its functionality and that for the purposes we need it for, with um, good images and the ability to, um, you know, sort of have a fairly stable uh, interface, um, that uh, it, it does tend to be the solution of choice for many faculty members in terms of the video conferencing they wanna do with their students, the breakout rooms you can do um, and so forth, the ability to uh, moderate discussions among participants. So, um, you know, people do wanna choose it often. And so what we're trying to do instead is just address some of the privacy concerns, um, security concerns directly rather than abandon the solution entirely.
Okay, great. Uh, we've got a question in uh, through the Zoom Q&A. Uh, the provost mentioned accommodating students who choose not to do online courses. What about the same recognition of instructor choice and need? For example, some instructors may feel unsafe if there is a partial resumption of in-person teaching before the risk of transmission is eliminated and may therefore prefer remote teaching. Others might feel that they do not have the resources or skills to do online or may want to invoke their collective agreement right to choose the format of their course. You know, we're in very unusual circumstances. And in order to actually maintain the functioning of the university, as well as to ensure that we are not creating obstacles for our students to be able to advance in their program and uh, to graduate uh, when they would normally um, be planning on graduating, we have had to make a variety of decisions um, we've worked very closely in discussion with various unions. Um, we've worked closely with Senate on why we really had to move to an online and or remote delivery format. And so we've been, uh, for summer, we did our very best to try to accommodate uh, ind individual faculty members' um, preferences. Uh, because we, it was always possible to defer into um, fall and, and winter. But that will become challenging as we move forward with fall, especially if we have to rely predominantly on fall. And I think that if we have the odd faculty member who feels that they are simply unable to um, move on to online or some other type of remote instruction, that the conversation with that faculty member will have to be how that person would make up their teaching responsibilities um, when we were back on campus. And we would have to have a conversation to ensure that we were able to deliver the courses that that faculty member would normally be delivering. We obviously want to ensure that the entire required curriculum and that we are delivering it. So again, look, we wanna do everything we can to accommodate our faculty members. Um, you know, similarly, given the importance that online education is likely to have, certainly for fall, but, but frankly, long-term, um, you know, we don't know what a second wave, you know, if, if a second wave could happen for the COVID, we don't know for sure um, when the vaccine uh, will be uh, found. Um, there could be some other challenge in the future. So I think that, that uh, there are faculty members who have an interest in delivering their course online, uh, especially when we think about trying to also serve the international student population who might not be comfortable in traveling for up to a year. Um, I, I think that that would be welcome, frankly, and that the normal mechanism that we have now for deciding on the delivery of courses is that each unit working with their dean, their faculty, they sort out the, the mix of online and face-to-face -face, um, courses. Obviously, if we can't have face-to-face -face, uh, courses or if there are limits, those conversations are going to be a bit more difficult, but there's an opportunity there for a department to come forward to um, a dean as part of their planning to say that we have you know, a few individuals who really feel they can't take this on. And this is how we might be able to accommodate that particular faculty member's teaching um, you know, in the winter, summer, for example. So we're gonna do everything that we can to be as responsive and accommodating as possible. If we get into a situation where we've got a real difficulty um, that would require a conversation with the, uh, the union, then that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll go and have a conversation with the union about you know, how we might be able to deal with you know, a particular situation that we don't have an obvious solution for. Okay, so related to that uh, question of uh, you know how we we support and accommodate faculty, um, it was a question uh, received over email. Contract faculty appreciate the access to learning resources. Uh, however, this learning and preparation represents an enormous investment of time. Will contract faculty be financially compensated for this work? 
Also, what about contract faculty who need to upgrade slash purchase technology in order to transition to online teaching? Um, the, I know the provost has been having conversations with the deans on some of these issues, so I think it might be best for her to speak on this matter. Sure, and, and Sheila also might have a comment because we have been uh, actually having some uh, very regular discussions with all of the academic unions on campus to um, surface these kinds of issues, to be in touch about them, to look for solutions that can work for everyone. Um, and there have been discussions about um, the additional costs that QP uh, 3903 Unit 2 members in particular may be incurring in order to be able to deliver their courses remotely. So I do um, have some confidence that we're going to be able to find some solutions there. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the additional work required to deliver online, you know, I think there's a, a wide range of different um, situations out there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we do have collective agreement provisions that speak to, you know, when a course it has been only delivered face to face and there's a request to redesign it as an online course, we have very clear provisions about additional compensation there. Um, but that, that would be sort of, uh, you know, one situation. Another would be um, we're trying to be very flexible about um, how, how a, a remote teaching could be done so that it can also be done with less intensive. Um, types of um, types of activity. Uh, and so we're still working on those issues with the academic unions and I will just create an, an opening there if Sheila wanted to add anything about those conversations. No, I, I don't think I have anything to add. The conversations with the unions are actually going quite well. Um, and I'm, I, I think that we're gonna have a resolution to that in the near future. So sort of staying with uh, the, uh, you know, the demands and requirements of, of online education for a bit here. Um, and I think this might actually be uh, our last question as we're almost to the end of our program uh, before we do some closing remarks. Um, how can York U ensure that any online materials and or pre-recorded lectures do not migrate over to the broader internet? So how do we protect intellectual property? You know, each faculty member at York University owns their own IP on their course materials and whether or not that's lecture notes or videos or whatever it might happen to be. Um, you know, there are mechanisms if anyone were to be discovered to be using somebody else's materials without um, permission. Um, it has happened at York that we have sometimes historically hired some faculty members to actually and compensated them for the development of an online course that was intended for broader use by other colleagues. So unfettered, the, the faculty member still retains the IP, but they agree in developing the course to give unfettered access to that course by other faculty members. And we have done some arrangements like that, um, but that's with, with the, uh, the agreement of a faculty member and a contract is, is developed for that purpose. So, you know, we'll take all the normal steps that we always do and that we have been doing historically for the online courses that we've been offering to date. Um, and if a complaint is made, then we would pursue that complaint. Yes, Lisa. I would just add that if you go onto that going remote site that the Teaching Commons has set up, they have a section on intellectual property rights and they do have some suggestions about language that you can put into um, your course syllabus um, that you can, uh, you know, introduce at the start of lectures and so forth to really remind students that this is proprietary information that's not to be recorded or it's not to be used for other purposes, it's not to be put on the internet, you know, in other ways. Um, so there can be some ways that you can just do a bit of proactive, um, you know, to try to discourage and remind people that this is not just because it's online doesn't mean it's sort of free and open to the entire world. So um, you might want to check out those, um, those best practices tips on the Teaching Commons website. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've reached uh, the end here and we've gotten through quite a few uh, questions. So I just wanna turn it back to President Linton uh, for some closing remarks. Look, um, I, I understand very much the need for clarity. And I want to acknowledge that we do not have all the answers yet. 
you know, we've been in working intensively um, to deal with winter and then summer, and now really turning our attention to the longer term planning. Um, I, I want to say that some of the decision making that needs to be done is a matter for Senate, Senate executive. Some of it is an administrative responsibility, and some of it is a board responsibility, um, especially when we start looking at the financial impacts. Um, we will have to work collectively together to try to sort out how we are going to deal with the potential financial impacts of this. It will not be easy, um, but I've been impressed uh, and incredibly grateful for the way in which this community has come together um, to try to uh, resolve the issues that we're faced with. And I think it's really important going forward that as we try to make some firm decisions for fall by about mid-May, that we've asked every dean to go back to their faculties and talk to their chairs and directors about how best to manage fall in a very high likelihood situation of a significant number of courses, if not all courses, um, needing to be delivered online, how some face-to-face -face could be introduced. And we wanna benefit from all of that um, conversation to come back to figure out the optimal plan for our faculty, for our course, all of our course instructors, for our students and for our staff. So I just wanna thank all of you for what you've been doing um, for the university, for each other and, and for our students. Thank you so much.